think Manchester United is uh, it's like a religion to the people. Man United were the first one to play 16 and 17 year old players. And then the first ones to break into Europe. I still regard this as my club. I think we all do, all yeah. the players from that, yeah. you know, that era. We, uh, and it was such, uh, I, I was watching something the other day, Bob Paisley was talking about Liverpool, yes. saying about the family atmosphere, it, yeah. and that's exactly what it was like. I always wanted to create a feeling that we were all part of the club, even uh, no matter who they were, the, the washerwomen, we're all a team. It's always been a vibrant place, it's never been a boring place. There's always something been happening here. The jubilant winners display soccer's most coveted scrap of silver to an ecstatic crowd. Mr. Wiebacher, President of the European Union of Football Associations, handed it over. It's easy to imagine how excited they are, though the cup has never been treated this way before. As the news of the disaster became known, Britain was appalled. Among the fatalities were seven members of the famous Manchester United team. The losers congratulate the winners and join the fans, all except one anyway, in cheering United's captain, Johnny Carey, as he receives the cup from the hands of His Majesty the King. Another handshake from the Queen, as she presents him with his cup winner's medal. The seeds of Manchester United were sown in 1878 when the dining room committee of the carriage and wagon works of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway formed a football team. With a green and gold strip, it was given the cumbersome name Newton Heath brackets L and YR after the location of the railway yards. Matches were played nearby at a ground at the junction of North Road and Monsell Road of which nothing remains save for descriptions of the pitch. It was said to be a clay pit as hard as flint and surrounded by a quagmire. Such dressing room facilities as there were were available at a nearby pub, the Three Crowns in Oldham Road. 
By 1889, Newton Heath played in the local league, having left railway competitions behind. And together with 11 other clubs, among them the future Manchester City and Birmingham City, were combined to form the Football Alliance, inferior only to the first division. Three years later, the Football League decided to expand Division 1 and created Division 2 from the Alliance. Newton Heath and Nottingham Forest were promoted to the first division and joined clubs like Everton, West Bromwich and Sunderland. In 1893, the club moved from North Road to a ground at Bank Lane, Clayton. Built in the shadow of a chemical works, a local rhyme had it that as Satan was flying over Clayton for hell, he was chained in the breeze, likewise the smell. Quoth he, I'm not sure in what country I roam, but I'm sure from the smell I'm not far from home. During successive seasons, there The club was saved by a group of four men who each injected £500 into it. Heading the consortium was Manchester brewer J. H. Davies, who became the new president, and from the ashes of Newton Heath, a new club was formed, with a new name, Manchester United. With Davies's financial backing and enthusiastic support, and the shrewd team purchases of manager J. E. Mangnall, the club began to move forward. By 1906, they'd won promotion to the first division. Two seasons later, they were league champions. And the following year, 1909, they won the FA Cup. At the start of that season, plans had been unveiled for a new ground. It was to be built at Old Trafford, would hold 80,000 people and provide full facilities for players and spectators alike. It would cost £60,000. By February the 19th, 1910, the plans had become reality, and Old Trafford opened its doors to the 50,000 people who turned up to watch United's inaugural match against Liverpool. United lost 4-3 on what to them was still an away ground, but soon made themselves at home, finishing the season fifth from top. As if to prove their point, they took the league title the following year. This was their last major honour for many years. Their manager, J. E. Mangnall, joined Manchester City, and from then on, the club drifted like a boat without a rudder. Successive managers tried to put the club back on course, but still they wandered from second to first division and back again, perhaps uncertain as to their rightful place. J. H. Davies died in 1927 to be succeeded by James Gibson. He too injected cash into the club and fought off the creditors. By 1938, United were back in the first division, but their debts now amounted to £75,000. When the Nazis made their ferocious aerial attack on Manchester, they adopted the now familiar tactics of flare dropping followed by incendiary bombs. Why the flare dropping, goodness knows, for they still bomb indiscriminately. The disaster that befell United during the night of March the 11th, 1941, served to add to their problems. Stray German bombs from an air raid directed at the industrial complex of Trafford Park fell on Old Trafford, wrecking the pitch and demolishing the stand. By 1945, the debts and the debris were still there, 
and the search began for a manager to take it all on. Uh, they wanted me to be assistant manager at Liverpool. And there was some offers from Scotland and out of the blue uh, I got an offer from Manchester United and I was always a lover, lover of Manchester anyway. And uh, I eventually, after meeting the old Mr. Gibson, Mr. Jimmy Gibson, uh, I signed for Manchester United as the team manager. Guiding United is ex-star Matt Busby, keeping a player's eye on the first team workout. Matt Busby was soon styled a tracksuit manager. He went and trained with his team, an approach that took the older players by surprise. Before the war, of course, managers uh, were not quite in that. Uh, they weren't tracksuit managers. They didn't sort of go. They were sort of administrators. Matt and Jimmy Murphy played with us. We, we played. They were inside, and Jimmy Murphy was a dirty little one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you didn't do what you should have done, you got clogged. <laughs> a lot of people say when, when the war finished and Matt more or less took over, uh, he, he had a team, but he never had a team at all. He had some talent, but it definitely needed sorted out. We had a right fullback who, who kicked the ball the way he was facing. Half the time, it finished up in the stand. <laughs> <laughs> um, my general idea was to to build a side that played that was exciting or entertaining or trying to play football. Skipper Johnny Carey clears an early Yeovil raid, and from then it's united all the way. The near-perfect soccer machine in action. A corner starts the avalanche, and Jack Rowley scores goal number one. Another corner and another goal. Jack Rowley again the scorer. All this time, the United were waiting their chance, and Pearson, the inside left, moves centre and heads in Manchester's first goal. Four minutes later came the second Manchester goal, and again it's Pearson who beats Wallace with another magnificent header. And there's still more to come. Jack Rowley scores number eight to make his own tally four. Uh, our ambitions were realised in 48 when we, we beat Blackpool in the, in the final. This is uh, one of the, they claim it is one of the great finals that's, that's been played, played at Wembley. A close duel between Manchester's Johnny Carey and Blackpool's Walter Rickett, number 11, is highlight number one in a thrill-packed match. Highlight number two comes when Stan Mortensen is tripped in the penalty area and referee Barrick awards Blackpool a spot kick. As the crowd rise to cheer, Eddie Schimmel drives it home to give the Seasiders the lead. Manchester's Jack Rowley walking the ball into the net to equalise provides highlight number three. Free kick and a seemingly impossible angle. Stanley Mortensen whips in a goal to give Blackpool the half-time lead. But now Manchester's attack, which has scored 95 goals this season, swings into its best style. From Johnny Morris's well-placed free kick, the fans cheer Jack Rowley's headed equaliser. With the score at 2-all, Blackpool are again on the attack. Stanley Matthews, who has been shut out effectively, beats Manchester's Johnny Aston, but the seaside is finishing his poor. Charlie Mitten, number 11, starts off United's winning attack, and from Rowley's pass, Stan Pearson scores the goal that gives Manchester the cup. <laughs> the King hands the silver trophy to skipper Johnny Carey. Their 4-2 victory, snatched in the last few minutes, gives Manchester United the reward they richly deserve. By then, the side, led by Johnny Carey, was beginning to feel its age, and a new set of players had to be found. From then on, we, we concentrated purely and simply on youth because that was my 